Are you one of those players interested in PvP in the Elder Scrolls Online, but have no idea how the top players are so survivable? Or how do they do so much burst damage? Welcome back, gang. It's Deltia from DeltiasGaming.com. And in this video, I'm going to do a deep dive explaining some of those questions with real, concrete answers so you can take and apply this information to any build for immediate and long-term growth as a PvPer in the Elder Scrolls Online. Before we get started, please do me a big favor and smash that thumbs up button and consider checking out my PvP builds on DeltiasGaming.com, as I have fully customizable builds for each class and playstyle ready for you to pick up and use. Buckle up, here's what the top players in ESO PvP aren't telling you. The foundation of PvP centers on the obvious factors, damage and healing, but also situational awareness and mobility. I learned a useful tactic while in the army and that's called bounding. You as a new PvPer or an experienced one need to rewire your brain to constantly scan and evaluate your environment in order to find a place to cover when combat initiates. This also works in ESO too, by immediately running to a rock, tree, pillar, well, keep, anything really. Always consider, what if 20 Aldemary Dominion bow users showed up? Where will you go? How will you escape? And what's the next step for you to survive? To illustrate this point, let's take a look at some footage of a huge Faragel keep fight. The first thing running to my brain is the amount of players and also two factions on this keep, meaning there's probably going to be around 20 to 30 players in the area that are hostile and very few friendlies. I'm on my slow magic Templar, so if I commit to Ramboing in, I need a place to escape, line of sight, and survive. With that same frame, I see two rocks, one near and one far, in the bottom of my right mini-map. Sorry, console fan here. I notice a blue resource, the farm. This gives me three points of retreat opportunities if I get in trouble. This is what you have to start doing to be an elite PvPer. Constantly evaluating your train and knowing when to get out and where you're going to go before combat initiates. Otherwise, you're going to be out in the open and get nuked. Let me keep on explaining this. It's really important. Now, let's Rambo in and jump ahead to the retreat point. I immediately start to evaluate my surroundings and hang a by a nearby rock and for lack of a better phrase start rock humping as we continue the fight i remain around this rock as my primary retreat point not to be in the open world as my class lacks streak or a high mobility skill but i'm very tanky and annoying to kill around a rock or something to break line of sight now my friend pain the axe leaps into his death man down and it's me and a bunch of my 80 friends out in the open what do i do rock hump use a train which literally is two sides away and be god awful annoying to kill. Constantly rotating around rocks, cycling my buffs and trying to pick off weak targets, not tanky ones. My goal here isn't to kill everyone because it's unlikely. It's to survive and hope reinforcements come or they get so annoyed with me they run off and pick on a poor little old weak lamb. You know who you are. I'm going to show you exactly how to build your character to be this annoying nightmare on the battlefield. I build my house. I use a heavy attack to get back resources, defensive ultimates to survive and line of sight. I have a high movement speed ability, which I'll talk about much later in depth. I have a gear set up to provide the most damage reduction possible, and I have years of experience in fighting now number, though I'm also a great zergling. And yes, I get killed, but this is an example of how bounding skill, gear, line of sight all works to make you extremely tanky without exploits, cheats, or hacks. They bagged me, bro? Do I have your attention now? Let's move on. Step one to being extremely survivable is having a skill that increases speed via the major expedition buff, but also preventing snares and immobilization so you can break line of sight, heal, and resource regenerate without getting locked down by immobilization or a snare. The best overall solution, regardless of class and playstyle, is race against time from the Psychic Order, or also called Rat. Yes, I know it's dreadfully painful to get this on every character, but it's worth the effort. This will give you speed boost, but most importantly, instant removal of snares and immobilizations. You cannot be locked down in place and killed. Here are some alternative skills if you can't or don't want to get wrapped. Two-handed skill, forward momentum. Five-piece or more medium armor user, shuffle. Dragonite protective plate, sorcerer street. Nightblade phantasm will escape. Templar extended ritual, though be aware of plague break five-piece debuff, which can kill you or your entire group. Go boom. Warden skill Betty Netch, also be aware of Plague Break with the risk. Necromancer Expunge and Modify. Again, Plague Break go boom. There's a risk here. You can reuse Race Against Time in one of two ways. Obviously, as escape mechanism, casting the skill, combining Sprint and the Immovability Potion would prevent you from being stunned. One Immovability Potion I use frequently on my Magpar is created using Bug Loss, Columbine, and Wormwood. This restores health, magic, and gives me over 10 seconds of being unstoppable, meaning I can't be CC. And 
And for the love of the maker, make sure you max out your alchemy skill line and get three points into medicinal use as it extends the effect to its maximum duration and will also help your recovery. More on that later. With an immovability potion active, you cast Race Against Time. You'll have a boost in speed, prevention of being snared, immobilized, and stunned. And this is how the top players get away from you so easily. You can and should use this exact same combination when you launch in for a huge offensive nuke burst window. This combination I'm going to show and explain to you is what people have been using for years to be ultra tanky, but then go on the offense and do mind-numbing DPS in a short window, because PvP, it's all about burst. The first part of this combo is the Balorg Monster Helm that comes from March of Sacrifice, giving you offensive penetration and raw damage for the amount of ultimate you use, not what it costs. Now, you combine this Monster Helm with a Back Bar 5-piece set, Craftable Clever Alchemist, which at legendary quality grants you 675 weapon and spell damage. Combine Balorgs with Clever Alchemist and a potion, and you're getting over 1,100 weapon and spell damage an enormous amount of penetration. Not to mention, you can further increase the weapon and spell damage by using medium armor via the agility passive in the skill line. Also, look at the Magpar. Balance Warrior giving you a 6% spell damage increase and Illuminate giving you a 10% spell damage increase. This is how the sweats nuke you down, even though being very tanky. It's the combination of chugging the movability potion, saving up for a 500 ultimate, and hitting you in a very tight burst window. No, it's not a hack. No, it's not a cheat. It's just the math of the game. Big deeps. Now you got some mobility. You know the burst combo that the sweats are using, but how in the world are these top players so god-awfully tanky? Glad you asked. Let me explain. The foundational defensive skill you should slot and incorporate in all your builds is an armor buff skill to reduce incoming damage via major resolve and every class has one. You can expect around 8% damage reduction for maintaining major resolve buff and that buff stacks on top of other damage reduction buffs like minor resolve, minor protection, major protection, and so on. You can't stack multiple major protections, but minor and major, you definitely can. Here's a quick list of armor buffs for each class in case you're unaware. Dragonite, Spiked Armor, Sorcerer, Lightning Form, Nightblade, Shadow Barrier, Templar, Rune Focus, Lord Warden, Frost Cloak, Necromancer, Bone Armor. Now, you want to stack additional damage reduction skills and passive for further reduction. You can slot Psychic Order Ultimate and Temporal Guard on your defensive back bar, which passively grants you 5% damage reduction via the Minor Protection buff. You then grab the Revealing Flare skill from the Alliance War Support skill line, slot it, and gain an additional 10% damage reduction via the Major Protection buff, and a further benefit of 10% Magic Recovery for slotting this skill via the Magic Aid passive. While you're on your back bar, that's 5% from Temporal Guard and another 10%, which does stack from Revealing flare, major and minor protection all at once. But we're not done yet. Now, go into champion points and take Payne's Refuge slotable from the Fitness Tree and the Survivor Spite sub-constellation, which reduces your damage taken by 1% per negative effect on you, up to a maximum of 20%. Now we're going to use a Nord Race and get an additional 2600 resistances via the Rugged Passive. Furthermore, let's use my favorite defensive five-piece back bar set, Iron's Blood, from Falkreath Hold. When proc, it reduces our damage by another 30% for a short period. You'll notice we haven't had any redundant buff, skill, passive. They all stack for huge damage reduction when you need it most. Okay, I'm not good at math, but this has to be it. Nope. Lastly, let's make our character Vampire, and at least stage 3 for the Undeath Pass of reducing your damage taken by up to 30% based on your missing health. And now you can start to see why some players are godlike tanky. Not a hack, not a cheat. Math of the game. 8% Major Resolve via the Armor Buff. 5% Minor Protection via Temporal Guard. 10% Major Protection via Flare. Up to 20% for Pain's Refuge CP Slottable. 30% for Iron's Blood via this gear set when it's proc. Up to 30% undeath passive if you're a vampire. Secret exposed. It's obvious now that you're going to need a burst heal to combine with your damage reduction and mobility. The hybrid changes to ESO essentially means you still want to stack one stat, either stamina, magic, and weapon and spell damage. The game will dynamically look at whatever the higher stat pool is. For the effectiveness of the skill, it does not matter what it costs to cast the ability. Meaning, if you're playing 
slain a stamina dragonite and you only have 12,000 magic and 3,000 spell damage, but you have 30,000 stamina and 5,000 weapon damage and you cast coagulating blood, which is a magic based ability. The heal's effectiveness will be based off of the highest stamina and weapon damage, giving you an incredible burst heal, even though it costs magic. Don't believe me or you've heard different? Great. Let's do an experiment. Example number one, we will use my stam dragonite and spec all of our attributes to a whopping zero. We will use coagulating blood as a magic based heal as an example. And the tooltip is 8,554. Example number two, we'll split our attributes, 32 and 32 magic and stamina. Now the heal 9,072 on the tooltip. And example number three, we're going to spec all of our points into stamina. And wait for it, the tooltip 9,590. So obviously, a lot more health, even though it costs magic and we're specced into stamina. So what this means is essentially your off stat becomes just as useful and powerful as your main stat, especially on stamina builds who get access to burst heals, typically magic cost or magic based. I suggest investing in resource intensive foods like Smoke Bear Haunch or the cheaper version Jewels of Mistru to sustain both of these stat pools. If you want to get real sweaty, I'm talking dripping sweaty. Some are even stacking weapon and spell damage based off their class passives. Let me explain. The Dragonite, for example, has minor brutality via their Mountain's Blessing passive, which gives you 20 seconds of 10% increased weapon damage for casting an Earth and Heart ability. So ironically, some magic Dragonites could essentially run weapon damage, Munda Stone, and Jewelry enchants to take advantage of this in-class unique buff because it dynamically scales. Remember, whatever is highest, big brain. Regardless of your build or playstyle, here are some burst healing options if you're unaware. Dragonite, Coagulating Blood, Sorcerer, Twilight Matriarch, Nightblade, Healthy Offering, Templar, Honor the Dead, Warden, Enchanted Growth, Necromancer, Resistance Flesh. The secret exposed here with healing is stacking multiple sources of healing, and let's use the Magic Dragonite for an example. And remember, values are cut in half inside PvP due to the Battle Spirit debuff. Let's start with Rapid Regeneration from the Restoration Staff skill line, giving us around 1,700 heal per second inside of PvP. Burning numbers, right around 1,500. Healing potions on our front bar, you can expect 1,000. And Cinder Storm, another 1,200 heals per second. Now you're sitting at roughly 5,000 or more heals per second without casting a burst heal or getting a heal from an ally. Combine this with mobility, huge damage reduction, and you're a walking drug or not. EXPOSED! And briefly touching on this, but it's buff cycling. Make sure to constantly cast your buffs pre and during a fight. I'm talking armor, weapon or spell damage buff, heals over time, an ally buff, anything that enhances your damage or reduces your damage taken. I can make a separate video on this, but think of it in terms of bounty, which we covered earlier. Every second you want to be evaluating your terrain, but also prepare all of your buffs prior to an engagement. Let's do a thought experiment like Albert Einstein. Example number one, Puglet Little Deltia, focusing on reading chat during his live stream and telling bad dad jokes. Deltia doesn't keep up his armor buff, heal over time, or a mobility skill. Engagement happens, now Puglet Deltia has to cast three to four skills before even fighting, let alone use his limited brain cells to find a spot to bound, hide, regen, and heal. Example number two, Sweat Lord Deltia, focusing 100% on gameplay, looking for self-validation and ESO PvP performance. This Deltia constantly cycles through buffs, even if it's boring or redundant, going longest to shortest, even when no one is around. Armor, heal over time, mobility. Armor, heal over time, mobility. Now, when combat engages, Sweat Lord is gaming, can engage, run, or nuke with all buffs active rather than reacting. If you got nothing else from this video, constantly practice cycling your buffs like all the sweats do. Because the fight kicks off, then you have to spend three to five seconds on buffing. It's the difference between being a 1vx god and a walking soul gem. Now, let's switch gears and talk about stats to aim for and the thought process behind it. People always ask me about stats, how they're important, why, what should you aim for, and I'll try to keep it Barney, Deltia level in general terms for you regardless of the class. Let me explain. Let's start with health, the obvious choice. The lower your reaction time and skill, the more health you need. When you increase your health, you lower your main stat, thus decreasing your damage and healing typically. You need to find the sweet spot between dealing damage, healing, but not dying in one second constantly. Sure, everyone gets ganked from time to time, but running in a Cyrodiil with 
18,000 health will be the worst experience of your life. Typically, when I start coaching someone, I start them at 32,000 health. I see the reaction time and adjust from there. God's gift to the game? Fine, you can rock 22,000 health. Slow as molasses to break free? We're going to put you at 64 attributes and health, 40,000 health. Start high with training wheels on and lower as you learn and get more comfortable. Next up is the age-old debate between raw damage, meaning weapon and spell damage, versus penetration stat, physical and spell penetration. Pen, in general, gives you the most overall damage per stat. However, weapon and spell damage not only adds to your overall damage, but healing as well. Don't believe me? Great! Let's do an experiment. Let me jump on my magic dragonite. Example number one, we'll look at the coagulating blood heal tooltip with the Atronach Mundustone, which adds magic recovery. 10,596. Example number two, we'll switch to the lover, giving us offensive penetration. In the heal is, well, 10,596. No change. Example number three, let's switch to the Apprentice Mundustone, and now we hit 11,013, and that's a 3.9% increase in our overall heal on the tooltip. And as you can see, spell damage also affects our damage and heal healing. This is one reason the high-end players are able to run two five-piece damage sets that buff raw damage, because it increases your healing so significantly and your damage. Does that mean the penetration stat is dead? Absolutely not. It remains the highest and most coveted stat in general for pure damage. But remember, you want to be a sweat lord. Insane, survivable, high damage, so factor that into your build. Here are some ways you can get more penetration for your build. Mundestone the Lover. Weapon traits sharpen. Typically the best way to obtain penetration and remember dual wheel builds. Your offhand loses efficiency, so consider using the charge trait on the offhand versus double sharpen. Monster Helm, Balor, which we've already talked about, but in case you skip that, because this is YouTube, this is a great two-piece set, especially for stamina users. Light armor users get increased physical and spell pen per light armor worn via the concentration passive, while medium armor users get the agility passive, boosting your weapon and spell damage. Balor also gives you a boost of raw damage for a brief time, going back to our original premise. Burst for both healing and damage. Combine Balor with Clever Alchemist back bar, and now you have a 12 to 20 second massive burst window, and this combination has been used for years and is still good. Five piece gear sets. Some folks still use Heartland's Conqueror, Spinners, or Spriggans. I personally don't see these being that useful, but it's a good place to start getting them cheap, and they work great in no proc Cyrodiil campaigns, if anyone plays there. Now, let's take my unbuffed Magpar. I'm sitting right around 10,000 penetration and I think this is a good number to aim for unbuffed. 10 to 12,000. Add in major or minor breach and you'll be hammering down opponents no problem. Now we have recovery which can be a tricky one because if you're using engine guardian it won't show up on the stat sheet. Where's my engine guardian gang at? If you're using stage 3 vampire for the undeath pass of damage reduction you're gonna need a ton of recovery due to the negative effects of increased ability cost. And lastly level up alchemy for god's sakes and get the medicinal use passive. This will make your potions last much longer giving you over 100% uptime if you're using potions on cooldown. Also, movability if you've listened to me earlier. Don't skip the video. All that to say, I typically aim for 1800 recovery in my main stat, like on my Magpar, 1800 magic recovery, and then around 800 to 1000 in my off stat, meaning stamina. I play around with food choices, Munda Stone, gear sets, jewelry enchants to get there. I start by using parse food like Gasty Eyeball for magic users or stam users can use Lava Foot and see what my health is at. Then adjust my attributes to hit my targets. Even if it lowers my main stat and my DPS, I gotta have some recovery and I gotta have some health so I don't get nuked. Or using Smoke Bear Haunch or Jewels of Mystery to get recovery in both stat pools. The reason you need recovery in your off stat, especially for a magic build, is you're gonna be doing dodges, sprinting, blocking, and breaking free. If you don't have enough stam, you might as well just keep respawning at the keep. You're gonna be daddy spaghetti. Going back to the health analogy for new players, put training wheels on when you're new to PvP. Start with high recovery foods until you get the heavy attacking down, potions, and ultimate timing. Then start jacking up your main stat, lowering your health and recovery for more damage and healing. Keep in mind, some classes like the Magic Sorcerer can focus purely on high magic builds because it affects not only their damage, but shield strength and size. Using the stat and five-piece gear set is optimal for damage and survivability. Same with the Warden using Arctic Blast, which scales in effectiveness based off your max health. Be aware of your class, what stat benefits you the best do the passives and build around that. Too long didn't read here for general folks. Start around 32,000 health, 10k penetration, and 1800 recovering your main stat. With champion points included, these numbers will be 
be much different without CP. Well, gang, that's the video. I hope you got something out of this as it's pretty general, giving you some tips and tricks that the Sweat Lord used to either set up their stats, skills, and become unkillable living gods. But realize you're never going to get there if you give up and don't go through the uncomfortable stage of learning PvP. Start a brand new character and level entirely through Battlegrounds or Cyrodiil Sub-50 campaign. This will give you a much better understanding, experience, and you'll be able to get Alliance War skills, gear, and passive before you jump in with the big dogs. Also, if you're interested in 1v1 coaching, email me at info at deltiasgaming.com as I've helped many people improve their performance both in and out of games. Consider checking out my builds as I play all classes and do my best to keep these up to date. And lastly, I swear to God, I'm just about done. Come check me out on twitch.tv slash deltiasgaming and ask me questions if you got them. And as always, thanks for watching.